question. Hi there. Um, what are the practical uses of figuring out gravitational waves? The practical use of measuring gravitational waves? Why are we looking for them? This is a confirmation or the kind of the first test of Einstein's prediction that actually these things exist. The next step would be to do quantum gravity, which is significantly harder. Don't go there. Okay. Okay. So I don't go there. I will continue. So I explained you now how we can make cones, and I showed you some kind of graphs that show supposedly good results in the history of frequency measurements. But what I want to show you is in the next 20 minutes or so. I want to really go and test the performance of two independent cones. And so if I can do a good job stabilizing them together, I mean, even though they are separated in space, I should be able to transfer coherence from one cone or from one line all the way down, connect this to the next cone, go all the way up again, and beat this against each other. And if I can really transfer uh, the coherence, meaning the phase, through 100 terahertz range, back and forth, I should still be able to see a phase coherent interference between those two cones. So what I will do is I have two cones. I will lock these cones actually on the same side. I will have a very stable laser that connects these two. Then I do exactly the same thing I would do if I would just build one cone, but I do it twice. And then I compare on the other end of my octave, I will compare the two cones and see whether they are actually coherent. If they are coherent, I can generate a weak node between them that shows perfect phase coherence. So let's do it. So what do I need? OK, how good can we really transfer it? Shopping list, always good to start with a shopping list. OK, I need two nice frames a second cone. OK, bill comes to about $300,000. Then I need a nice laser with less than a hertz per second drift which is already hard because that's a hertz per second, uh, in this case 400 terahertz. Uh, so I need some strange noiseless fiber links because I have to plug everything together and things are far apart. I will explain why that's an issue. And of course I need lots of patience to optimize all these PIDs because there are 18 of them and I will send home all noisy people before I start. And actually did all these measurements of course during the night. That's the only way. So here is my first comb. I have my two resonator mirrors over here. I showed you this kind of system yesterday. It's a fiber laser. It's mode locked, not like in the morning. It's now a femtosecond mode locked system. I go through a stretcher. So this is now really the chirp pulse amplifier. Uh, we have seen this morning, but now for mode locked pulses. So I need to stretch the pulse very much. And I amplify it in one of those large mode area crystal fibers, exactly the thing we've seen this morning. I pump it with a lot of power, and then afterwards I compress it on grading. So here I never have to go through matter, because actually the output peak power here is already about 1.3 megawatts. So if I go through glass with 1.3 megawatts, bad things usually happen. But nevertheless, at the output I get a nice amount of power in a very short pulse. OK, now I take this laser. And then, since it's not octave spanning, I send it through a photonic crystal fiber. Since you have so much power, I need only a few centimeters of it, and I get a good octave. Then I take a very stable laser. This is actually coming from an atomic clock. This is the master oscillator of an atomic clock. It's, uh, the special thing about it is it is extremely narrow line. So it's an optical line with of about 100 millihertz. Typical lasers have at least a few kilohertz. A dial laser has typically between a few megahertz and a few gigahertz. So it's a very narrow line. Then I use a PLL to stabilize one of the neighboring cone lines to this laser. So I get again a heterodyne beat. By the way, heterodyne beats are something like when you uh, go to a concert and there are two flutes playing the same note, and the flutes are slightly detuned. You can hear a beat between them, and this beat frequency is exactly the difference frequency between the two. The speed note happens also, a photodetector is light, so I can easily see this offset. Okay, then of course I have my 1F, 2F interferometer to stabilize the offset frequency, and I do that by feeding back to my pump dial and some other. 
control nodes, and the cavity lines will control my uh, bead knot over here. Okay, that's lesson number one. Lesson number two uh, is locked to the same source because if I lock to the same source, to the same reference, I can get rid of the noise of this reference. That's a requirement to test the comb performance only. Now I lock another laser to this one because I have to transfer this line here all the way to another room to interfere with this one. And now the actual measurement happens by measuring the interference between this one line here and one of the comb lines over here. So if the comb really works out, I can transfer the stability over here through the comb. I do the same through this comb. If I don't have extra noise from the combs, I get a nice and sweet beat knot over here. And so here is kind of the spectrum we get. We lock one of two of by lock tape. We have our atomic clock laser over here. I lock the repetition rate. And then I do the beat knot pretty much in the center of everything. So here we have 100 terahertz, hundreds of terahertz with and let's keep this one. Okay. So if I do that, and if I do a good job, and I synchronize everything well with my phase lock loop, actually I get a delta function in these beat nodes, and this delta function contains nearly 100% of all the power, meaning that suddenly my comms line width collapses to the line width of my reference laser. The same happens with the offset frequency. These are maybe some details which would require a little more discussion. Anyway, the other laser is actually simply an octave spanning sapphire laser. This is a very, very established system, and this system was used uh, for a few years now to transfer uh, the stability of this optical clock over to least, which is about three kilometers away, or three miles away actually from, from our lab. And so it makes an octave, I can easily stabilize the offset frequency by doing this double click again, and then I lock the uh, atomic clock laser to the comb and then I have to transfer uh, to the other comment. So here in another cartoon, just repeat it again, I have my fiber laser comb, I lock this comb to an atomic clock, then I uh, stabilize offset frequency itself. I do exactly the same with this titanium sapphire comb, stabilize the offset frequency, lock it to the atomic clock, then I take an extra laser, this is called usually a transfer laser because it allows me to transfer the information or the phase stability of this comb to another room. And uh, then I do a beat here, simply a beam splitter between this laser and this comb. There is nothing locked or anything. And then I look at the outer flow beam mode. And so the problem is these are actually rather big experiments. So this high power fiber laser and stabilization takes nearly an optical table. The optical clock actually occupies two optical tables, and then this comb occupies about half an optical table. So they are actually all in different locations. Actually, these are in the same room, but this is in a different room. And so now transferring this kind of stability over even 20 meters in an optical fiber doesn't work at all. If I launch a millihertz or tens, hundreds of millihertz laser into an optical fiber after 20 meter, that line width is already broadened to about 100 hertz because of acoustic vibrations lead to Doppler shifts and so on. So I have to stabilize each of them accurately. And an easy way to do that is actually make a microsynthetic interferometer. Uh, I have a very short reference arm, which I assume is not perturbed. I, of course, pay attention that this is really the case. And then I have my long fiber, I retro-reflect some of the signal back and have feedback electronics then to actually correct the noise in the fiber. So here is kind of what happens. The red line is if I turn off my locking servo to actually not stabilize the fiber, I launch a, a 100 megahertz line signal in it, uh, I get already 10 to 100 hertz line with after 20 meter link. But if I close my loop, and I have two fibers, again, do a relative measurement, I get typically millihertz or even better than a millihertz line without. So this feedback is very crucial to, to do these measurements. Actually, if you have a, a RF oscillator, you oftentimes would simply connect the BNC cable to it and connect it to wherever you want to go with it. If you really want to work at the level, even at 10 minus 15 ish or so, you have to stabilize the length of your BNC cable just the same way. It's very really hard to work in this kind of machine. Anyway, this is now the out-of-loop beat note. 
we measured a thousand seconds, actually about 1024 seconds is an FFT scope, and the resolution bandwidth is 950 microhertz, and that's exactly what we see in the experiment. And then in time domain, this beat node is the red line, it's a sinusoid, the black line is a pure sine omega t with this frequency on it, so there is no fixing of the frequency now over 15 seconds, and we see that this out of loop beat node between these two lasers that are in different rooms and actually we transferred the coherence twice over about the 100 terahertz range. They are still perfectly in sync and actually this would go on and on and on for pretty much ever because even within a thousand seconds we have never seen a phase difference that comes even close to one radiance. So we have a perfect coherent signal between these two. And again in terms of stability in 100 seconds it comes to a few parts in 10 minus 18. Actually, this corresponds to about one microwave per hour Doppler shift. And so this is a residual shift. I mean, we have all these fibers in there. We actually transfer light over 60 meters in total. But still, it can be just, and of course, it shows up as a last uh, So now, what does that really mean? I mean, I just showed you we achieved a thousand seconds at 300 terahertz, thousand seconds of relative coherence. Thousand seconds, the light makes three times 10 to the 17 oscillations and in our measurements, we have seen that both lasers made exactly 3 times 10 to the 17 oscillations, plus minus much, much less than one oscillation. So let's look at this in other terms. Here is the sun, here are the, I don't know where Australia is on this board, but somewhere here. <laughs> so here is the Kuiper belt, I didn't know there is a Kuiper belt, but anyway, the Pluto is about there, so it's kind of far away from the sun. So if I could, I go to Staples and I buy lots of typewriter paper or copy paper. I make a pile of paper from the sun all the way to the Cooper belt. I make another pile, that's my second comb. And then I compare at the end the stack between these two papers. And so this is the thickness of one paper. And this is about how far off these two papers will be uh, if you have the same fractional stability. So it's pretty impressive fractional stability. B is about 10 microns or so. So that's at the minus 17 years. Okay, anyway, I think for all it's worth, comps seem to be good enough at the moment, but what can we really do with it? So let me show a couple of applications. Okay, so from 2000 to 2010, actually, there were a real explosion of applications. I mean, you have a comp, of course, optical atomic clocks work, distance measurements are now done. So here we have a measurement done in Japan. It was one micron resolution for about 300 meters propagation. Here I measured actually uh, something with femtometer resolution is light, which is uh, about uh, hundreds or thousands of the diameter of an atom. Uh, that was a recent paper. Or different frequency spectroscopy using problems in cavity. Time distribution, that's actually important, for instance, for uh, accelerator facilities I mentioned. Free electron lasers might be a cool thing to do, and uh, there we have to synchronize light and electrons very accurately. So timing distribution is important. Another thing is uh, XUV generation, arrow-second pulse generation at high repetition rate. That's something we worked on in Boulder as well. Or here is actually kind of a strange application. You have light from a star collected by a telescope. Then we analyze it on a gradient spectrometer because what we want to do is we want to see does the universe expand, the expansion of the universe, does it accelerate over time or not? And what we really would have to measure is a Doppler shift or a change in Doppler shift of about five centimeter per second per year. But the stars we are looking at are going at about 0.8 C and are a few billion years away, a billion light years away. And so to really measure this accurately, you can utilize a femtosecond comb to calibrate the spectrometer over the course of many years. So there is quantum control in atoms directly done by cons also done in Boulder. Of course, this is all heavily biased. I don't claim this is a fully representative for them. Core molecules done by coherent round uh, process to drive them down from the excited state to the ground state. Anyway, let me show you at least a few of these applications. First of all, optical clocks, because that's kind of where this whole thing came from. People really wanted to measure optical frequencies very accurately. And the kind of a typical example is going to make an optical clock. So how does a clock work? Well, this is a clock, uh, at least the way it looked like a few years ago or a few ten years ago. I have an oscillator, 
it's pretty slow, it's megahertz. And then I have a gear up here, and all that gear does, it really counts the number of oscillations. If, if one oscillation goes, uh, I know it's one second, then I divide it by 60, I get one minute, and so on. So it's a pretty simple thing. An uh, optical clock is just about the same, except that this thing goes now with a uh, few hundred terahertz. I have a bunch of atoms with a very narrow transition. Again, H bar omega uh, gives me kind of the frequency here. When I take one of these ultra stable lasers, like the one we used in the previous experiment to compare two combs, I tune that laser just in a way that it's resonant with this line, then I get a lot of fluorescence, and again, I have some servo electronics to maintain this. Again, a PID you can do here. And of course, the gear is pretty easy here, it's just a frequency common. Uh, we interfere this laser with the frequency common. We can either get a radio frequency readout or optical readout if we want. So that's how the clock works. This is a little bit an old result, but kind of what was achieved four years ago. Uh, the transition is about 400 terahertz. The lifetime of this thing is about 150 seconds. 150 seconds is about 10 hertz, a uh, 10 millihertz line. So the Q factor is much better than with a cesium clock. In fractional terms, that's actually 1.5 times 10 to the minus 17. Again, that's about 10 centimeter of uh, altitude change for gravitational uh, effects. The atoms are cooled down actually to a fairly cold temperature. It's hard to do in the refrigerator. They are about 200 nanokelvin, so it's no microkelvin, no millikelvin, no kelvin. It's 200 nanokelvin away from absolute zero. And this is actually limited. That's half of one photon energy when you cool it down with laser light. And then these are trapped in a potential that looks kind of like an egg carton. So you have a few million of these, hopefully, at some point to uh, get a good signal to us. And so six, uh, four years ago, the Q factor that was measured was actually off the order of 3 times 10 to the 14. So when you look at the history again of atomic clocks, Ramsey found a nice way to actually use the cesium atom to make atomic clocks. It was not very stable, 10 nanoseconds, uh, 10,000 nanoseconds per day, but then there was a steady improvement over the years of fractional stability of such clocks, but actually in fractional terms we are now about uh, 3 times 10 to the minus 16 or 4 times 10 minus 16. But when you talk to the people who are working on those clocks, they all agree that they actually really don't know whether this will keep, whether it's possible to further improve these things. Because this is a very small fraction of an oscillation. And eventually that's an issue. And so optical clocks are far behind in terms of development because they really started out here. But actually when you look in the last five years or so, uh, optical clocks have already superseded the repeatability of atomic clocks. And so I think in another 10 years, this will clearly be a more interesting standard for frequencies. Clocks? Questions? Coffee? <laughs> Would you like to have some cake in the next coffee? <laughs> I have to volunteer, so if you have good questions. Oh. <laughs> so, I mean, in, in this graph, and also in the previous one, you are talking about the relative uncertainty and how it's getting better and better. Do you see it as something that, that could continue to improve? And, and what are the main limitations? Like, what, what's the next breakthrough you need with your laser systems to keep it going? Yeah, so for the, for the uh, microwave clocks, so these are the traditional atomic clocks. These are microwave clocks because they were on uh, gigahertz, which we call microwave wrongly. Yeah. But anyway. Uh, so here the problem is that we actually have 9 gigahertz, you see 9 gigahertz is, is around here if you are accurate to one cycle. So now you split this cycle by a large number and so a million of a cycle is really hard to measure because you measure the phase to uh, 1 million of so to pi. And so here people really don't know anymore how to improve. But for the optical clocks, oops sorry, for the optical clocks, the main limitation at the moment is the uncertainty from the black body radiation. So black body radiation is something at very low frequencies, it's in terahertz range. These transitions are at typically a few hundred terahertz. So it's quite far detuned, but from AMO physics or maybe quantum mechanics, you know that if you have an AC field wiggling 
your atom around, even if it's far off resonant, it will actually induce small shifts called the AC star shift in your level structure. And so this AC star shift from the black body radiation is a big uncertainty because we never exactly know the black body radiation at the location where your atoms are. There are big efforts to, for instance, shield away the atoms come from somewhere. They come from a oven, for instance. These are metals. So they come from a oven, then they are deflected so that the black body radiation from the oven is not shining on the atoms. So that helps. Then you have a vacuum pump somewhere. Most likely the pump inside has another temperature than the room. So this is actually also shielded by some uh, reflections. Your molecule has to reflect a couple of times before they go in there. And of course, these are all coated with some material that should absorb this radiation. But it's still a certain uncertainty of a few millikelvins at least. And so these few millikelvins, black body radiation can actually be a limitation here. So to do better, that's a problem. So you have to work hard on these. The best way to overcome this is to go to atoms that are less sensitive, to start shift. And actually, I might show you uh, nuclear spectroscopy, where you do spectroscopy on a nucleus on very far detuned levels. Far detuned, actually, in this case, 10 kilohertz detuned. And so black body radiation is no longer an issue. You have a lot of problems there. But so this will be kind of the really crazy next step, probably in the next 20 or 30 years. Not right now. But mercury atoms, actually, people believe they can reach a few parts in 10 minus 19. So we have a plan to keep going on this line. The plan on that line is a little bit more uncertain. At the but I mean, these people always surprised us for a long time. So I'm sure they come up with something else too. <laughs> they are good. OK. See, asking questions not so hard. OK, let me continue one more. Um, so this can go really fast. Direct frequency comb spectroscopy. So I have a frequency comb coming out of a laser. I want to analyze gas. I want to figure out what kind of molecules are in this gas. So here is my gas. If I send the beam through a gas, it absorbs maybe on certain levels. You remember in the beginning I showed you molecules vibrate. So this vibration are a few terahertz. So every few terahertz I might get a line from these vibrations. Then I have a detector array and I just look at how these lines got distorted or absorbed, and then I can maybe figure out what kind of molecules were there. This is not very sensitive if you have very few of them. So my goal is, I go to the doctor, I really hate syringes and stuff. I don't like to be poked with the skin. And so all I want to do is I want to talk to him, and maybe I want to breathe into a tube, and then my breath contains all the molecules he needs to know about uh, without actually taking my blood. And so the problem is you might have only one molecule in a billion or in a trillion of molecules, so I have to have a very sensitive system. By sending light through one molecule once, you will not see very much, but sending light through it many, many times, you might actually see something. And so the trick here is I put a, an optical cavity around it, and this cavity length is exactly matched to the round trip time in this laser cavity, and this way I can actually make sure that the cavity modes here shown in this cartoon line up precisely with those comb modes up here. And so the result is that the line can actually bounce back and forth ten thousands of times nowadays. And so I can amplify this effect by ten thousand times. So here is kind of a cartoon of these molecules flying to this cavity. In transmission I see now a greatly amplified absorption line for a single molecule. And actually each molecule has a very characteristic kind of fingerprint in the spectrum, and I can afterwards figure out uh, what kind of molecules are in my breath. So this is kind of where the comb shines, because the comb can build up at the same time. If I take a white light bulb, I get practically no light in it, because most of it is outside of those cavity resonances. So I really need a femtosecond comb. So best we can do at the moment are a few parts in a billion, but actually uh, we are on the way to see things of the order of a one part in a trillion. So another thing which uh, we worked on now uh, in the last five years about are combs at extreme wavelengths. This is kind of the preparation to go to nuclear spectroscopy because we need light in the x uv or X-ray domain. And so that's hard to do. So let me show you uh, why we want to do So stability actually of 10 minus 19 was shown already in 2004 in this nice science paper from Longchamp. Uh, we have just discussed 
like thousands of seconds of coherence. And uh, of course, since 2000, you know, we can actually use these things for phase stable transfer of frequencies in the optical domain. The problem is, femtosecond cones are usually at longer than 200 nanometer wavelengths simply because there is, I, we talked about chi 2 and chi 3, but there is no good chi 2 and chi 3 at shorter wavelengths, and simply because pretty much every material you find is black. Air is completely black at about 90 nanometer. So if air is black, you seemingly are in trouble doing optics experiments. So there is actually no transparent material in this frequency range. Of course, physics is clearly not limited to this, and I already told you about the lamp shift uh, measurement. And so one push, for instance, uh, is doing spectroscopy on helium ground state to measure the lamp shift of helium. But if you look at the frequencies you need, so this is the ground state of helium, and then the next excited states above it, all these frequencies are really high, and so 50 nanometer light required, 120 nanometer light required. Here we cannot just use a plasma arc like in semiconductor industry because we really need our nice narrow lines which uh, can then access this transition. So what we want is a femtosecond cone at this wavelength. So in the past there was a lot of work going on to do cones at different wavelengths. Typically the cones live like ethereum fiber lasers is around 1 micron, erbium is around 5, sapphire cones are at 800, so all of them are in the near infrared, but then we can do second harmonics of chi 2, some frequency chi 2 or different frequency chi 2, so we get the same chi 2 is really a winner here. I can create pretty much any frequency I want from the visible all the way down to the C. I mean, at radio frequencies, I don't have to do anything. We already have everything. And so we worked for a couple of years after the first combs were shown to cover as much spectrum as possible because actually a lot of interesting molecular vibrations occur at much longer wavelengths. And so I think the Sulin laser you might hear about tomorrow is a very interesting system. Now, Chi 2 stops working at about hard UV radiation. And so then next is vacuum UV or extreme UV and possibly X ray. And so there is just nothing. The problem is there are no lasers, uh, no nonlinear crystals, and no cones, which is bad because I like cones. And so there is actually kind of a way out of it. And that way is called high harmonic generation. The Chi 2 allows you to do second harmonic. High harmonic is some synonym for something like 10th harmonic, 20th harmonic, or people are even talking about the 1000th harmonic. So really high. The process requires insanely high intensities because it's actually based not on a crystal anymore, but on ionizing gas. So the idea how we use that, I have my frequency reference, I lock the comp to it, then I transfer it to a high harmonic generation here, and then I use my high harmonic cone directly to excite to maybe the nucleus of an atom, and then I get fluorescence from that guy, and then I can uh, work with it. The problem is we need typically a few thousand watts average power, and typically a few gigawatts peak power, so pretty large power. The reason is here. So I told you I cannot use crystals anymore. There is no glass that will be transparent. Air is absorbing, actually pretty much all gases are absorbing in this wavelength range. But what I can do is, if I have a very strong pulse, of course it's then going to be a femtosecond pulse because I need this large field. Now I bring a small amount of gas into a focus of this. If the intensity of my laser light is large enough, I distort, usually the potential of that and would look like this. I distort it so much that the electrons can be ripped away from the ion or atom. Uh, then they get accelerated in this large field because they see these tilted potentials that will be accelerated over here. The field turns around after one and a half femtosecond. So these guys slow down and then eventually they come back and recombine with the ion that's pretty much sitting there because the ion is much heavier than the electron. And so by Coming back, it has a large amount of kinetic energy. I did particle acceleration in the electric field, so it has a lot of kinetic energy. And this kinetic energy can actually be freed by recombining with the ion. And this high energy is freed in a single photon, which then gives me my desired uh, X-UV or X-ray radiation. 
if I have many of these atoms, it's interesting that they all see the same field at the same time. So that this process occurs in concert among all the atoms, and I get kind of an ensemble of this process, and I can actually get coherent radiation out of this one. So this is kind of a process that would allow us to do uh, this kind of higher one generation. This is known since about the beginning of the 90s. Uh, the problem is we do need large fields. We are talking about 100 terawatts per square centimeter. All these systems here, until about 2005, this event occurred only a few times per second, maybe a thousand times per second at most, because otherwise you need a lot of average power. And so that's what we need now, because we want to make a comb. A kilohertz doesn't work, because otherwise our comb is too finely spaced. We cannot resolve anything. So we, we want at least a few hundred megahertz, or mega, hundreds of megahertz. And so for this, we need a lot of power. And since the process is so inefficient, usually people just use a very intense pulse, a few per second, focus it into the gas jet. High harmonics are created, but then 99.999% or so are just lost on the beam block. And that's, these are expensive photons. So that's not so good. So conversion efficiency is typically 10 minus 5 to 10 minus 9. So not very efficient, not like a Chi 2 process. So what we now propose to do is we have, a, again, a passive cavity. We recycle the photons that are, would otherwise be blocked here. We recycle them inside of the cavity. And since we can control the phase of the electric field very well, we can make sure that we can constructively interfere the stuff that's in here with the stuff that comes into the cavity. By having constructive interference, I can build up significant powers inside of an empty cavity. And so maybe this can be very short. We moved on from sapphire systems also to fiber bases, as we have heard this morning. For the titanium sapphire, the pump power costs about $30,000 per watt, so it's a little bit inefficient to use. For a fiber laser, we can live with a few ten to $100 per watt. And again, I use large mode fibers, of course, to get these large average powers. Uh, you saw this plot this morning. What we do differently, though, this is all continuous wave, the black stuff. And this is mode lock. Mode lock is significantly harder because you have these high peak powers. So if I have 10 watt average power in the fiber laser, I have already a megawatt peak power, not, not only 10 kilowatt. And so to overcome this, we have to play a few tricks, and we don't get a kilowatt average power. So here is the fiber laser we talked about before. I take a passive cavity in a vacuum chamber, and since I like electronics, I have a box which stabilizes and synchronizes everything. And so if everything goes well, I can build up the light inside of this cavity. And then in this focus, I simply inject some gas. And then this high harmonic process occurs by ripping out electrons from it. And again, my laser induced plasma. And then high harmonic can be coupled out. So in the first step, we try to confirm that we really get this plasma and see how high is the intensity. It's very hard to measure the peak power or peak intensity in a focus you cannot access because it's actually in vacuum. You cannot put anything there because it would affect the thinness of the cavity. But the easy way to assess the real or measure the, the actual intensity is simply by putting some gas in and I measure the current that flows through my induced plasma, less induced plasma. And if I can ionize all the atoms, I know pretty much where I am. And I see a saturation of the current through the plasma as a function of intensity. Actually, the dotted line is theory. That's an ab initio calculation for krypton. And then you see our measurement just follows this line precisely. So we are very confident about the intensities we get inside of this focus. Here is, again, a movie uh, uh, taken by a simple picture camera in media mode. There is a small viewport on the vacuum chamber, so you see the plasma. So we get up to about 3 times 10 to the 14 watts per square centimeters and average powers of the order of 3 kilowatts and 100 femtosecond pulses. So in this plasma now, high harmonic radiation can be created, and it's created at 100 megahertz rate. So we have to couple it out somehow, and that's actually kind of a trick. It's a problem for scaling the power. So here is our cavity, a ring cavity. Laser light is coupled in here, and when everything is synchronized, I get my kilowatts in, in here. And the peak power is about half a gigawatt or so, and then it's focused down to a few micron diameter. 
to couple out the high harmonic, we actually first started with a piece of glass or a piece of sapphire that's on a Brewster center, and you know if you have the right polarization and Brewster center, it has no loss for the fundamental light, and since the high harmonic light is a different wavelength, you can actually see a reflection from this plate. The big problem is you introduce chi 3 medium into a really high intense medium. And so now this has a lot of nonlinearities, and uh, this limited our power scalability dramatically. So we tried a few things. We, for instance, drill a small hole through the mirror because XUV has a much smaller wavelength than the fundamental infrared, and so the divergence of the XUV beam will be much, much smaller than the infrared beam. And if everything goes well, the infrared beam sees nearly no loss, and the XUV beam gets coupled out. It didn't work so well. I mean, you see how small these holes have to be. Here is a 100 micron hole. Uh, the coating goes all the way to the edge. It was coated before, then laser machine with microwave drill from the back, and then etching, and so on. The problem is really that even though it's a nice small hole, you get some loss. We cannot operate the cavity in the fundamental mode anymore, but in the first exciting mode, which has zero field in the center. But all these things really hurt the high harmonic process much more. And we never really come much higher than the third harmonic, which you could get with a normal crystal as well. So that was not very successful. The real success came when a student had this nice idea to make a grading. Uh, this grading is actually on top of a normal black stack. You remember we yesterday talked about silicon dioxide and tannulum dioxide or titanium dioxide black stacks. This black stack is designed to be highly reflective for the infrared light under a large panel. And if you have a very large panel, actually, the thermal reflection of any material gets really high, even for XUV. XUV, you cannot make a mirror, actually. Metals are transparent. So the only way to get high reflectivity is to have something on a very shallow angle. And so this thing is on a very shallow angle. We etch a grating into it, but the grating's depth is only 40 nanometers, whereas this light is one micron wavelength. And so by having a sub-wavelength grating, the light, the infrared light, actually sees nearly no scattering loss. And we measured the scattering loss to be less than 0.1%. The XUV light can be designed to reflect very effectively, but effectively in this case means in the end probably about 10 to 20 percent. But anyway, this element now no longer introduces nonlinear material because the light is actually reflected and not transmitted. And so this really helps to scale the output power. So in 2008, we finally got our first nice high harmonic result where we see this is actually a screen uh, which we code. It's just a microscope slide. And we put sodium salicylate, which is actually very similar to aspirin, and that's really helpful for this experiment because this experiment is a little bit of a headache. So if you get a headache, you take some of these, and then you put the rest on a piece of glass, and that fluoresces them in the XUV. And so we see the high harmonic output coupled from our cavity up to the 21st harmonic in one go. And so the power levels are not very high, even though we heat the gas with about 3 kilowatts you only get about microwatts per harmonics out. And then at the really high harmonics, we get about one nanowatts. Uh, if we can scale the power just a little bit more, since this is such a nonlinear process, we probably can go even higher. Anyway, so this could be now used actually for spectroscopy and here to check line shifts. Each of these lines now contain about 300,000 comos, so you can think of these as individual femtosecond cones again in the x domain. And actually another thing that's kind of interesting, here we have now these very short wavelengths, and so having a short wavelength and a large bandwidth means we can actually make pulses that are much shorter than 3 femtoseconds, three femtoseconds. because the cycle duration of the 21st harmonic is now 3 femtoseconds divided by 21st, 21. And so this is an attosecond pulse regime, and that's how people do attosecond pulses. Usually not at high depth rates like we do, but we are more over, are more interested in cones than in attosecond pulses. And so again, this showed up as a front cover of major physics. So the specs were like three and a half kilowatts, hundred femtoseconds, and a, you know, a typical core or a half a gigawatt peak intensity. One big problem now, which I think if you're interested in these things, you have to solve eventually is actually damaging 
the optics. So yesterday I had a question, don't you damage optics if you have a megawatt inside of your laser cavity? I said no, but if you have kilowatts and uh, megawatts in the laser cavity, then you get into trouble. Typical mirror damage is about two gigawatt per square centimeter. So if you want to go high, you have to play some tricks with your mirrors and you have to have everything very clean. Vacuum is actually a difficult thing to do because if you have a fingerprint on your uh, vacuum chest, it takes about one year to pump the oils away from your fingerprints. So you cannot have fingerprints in vacuum. And the oils are hydrocarbons which can stick to your mirrors and blow off if you hit them with a large intensity. And so we had a problem and it really bothered us, so we needed a lot of this aspirin stuff for a while. Uh, because the enhancement always dropped at about the kilowatt. And so what we did is we put a small interferometer, this is a fissile interferometer, but it doesn't matter, it's just a parallel mirror behind this mirror. When we take a helium neon laser, shine it through the mirror, look at the CCD camera, nice mode, but once we lock up this cavity and we get the kilowatts inside, you see a strong distortion of the mirror surface because of heating occurs on the mirror. That's also a problem actually the gravitational wave people have now that they don't burn the mirror, but they heat up the mirror. Even if you have only one part per million absorption, you will induce some temperature change. The thermal expansion is a problem. What they do is actually they have a CO2 laser shining on each optics, compensating for that. So you heat the mirrors just the opposite way, where it's a little colder, you heat it a little bit more, and so you can actually overcome this effect to some extent. We have no choice to do that. We are not fit in the vacuum chamber. But anyway, this is kind of an unsolved problem still. Okay, this is the last three slides or so, and then I think it's time to wrap up. So as an outlook, Kind of, what can we use this for? Well, it's interesting, for instance, to do spectroscopy on helium or even on larger atoms. The inner shell transitions, they're all in the XUV domain or even harder X-rays at some point. But so nuclear clock is kind of a daydream, and since this is uh, kind of a class where you have now 30 years ahead of you to do research, I think it's good to have a daydream. So here is my grandfather's clock. We know how it works and it's a counter and we have atoms and so on. So now what if I replace those atoms where we always actually probe electronic transitions, what if I actually don't do this, but I want to go to the nuclear? So higher, and the higher frequencies and higher Q factors are uh, very tempting to actually use because Q factors that are at least a factor of thousand higher are predicted and the frequencies are much higher too. Another thing is, you know, the Merz power experiment. Merz power experiment really works well because the nucleus is very well shielded from the environment. I can put my atoms into a crystal without really perturbing the, the nuclear structure much, but I would never be able to do that with an with a electronic structure. I would have the pressure shifts or something like that. And so it's much better in moving against the environment. So I could make a solid state clock, which would be kind of nice. And so there is one candidate uh, which is very promising, 229 thorium. The problem is this is restricted in the US because you can make an atomic bomb out of it, which you don't want to, but anyway, it's a problem. But thorium is interesting because the nucleus has kind of an isomeric state, which is uh, a ground state that has a slight level splitting, and the lifetime of this level splitting is believed to be a few thousand hours. So there you go, your microwaves line and the frequency is petahertz to petahertz. So challenge, of course, will really require harder and harder radiation, UV or XUV, and of course we could in principle do that with a, a femtosecond laser. We take a, our ultra-stable laser, which we already use now in an atomic clock, we servo that to a femtosecond cone. Then we couple this into an enhancement cavity, create XUV light in the enhancement cavity, then let it interact with the nuclei from thorium, and if everything works well, if the frequency is just right, we can get some uh, fluorescence from this or a change in absorption. Actually, we wouldn't measure the absorption of fluorescence, but we would measure the change in the electronic level structure because the excited nucleus creates a slight shift in the electronic level structure. And so this would be kind of the great table for now. Anyway, any questions? Thank you, Jules.